Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Avoca United Methodist Church. Here comes Ron, just a, or Rob, just a hustle in trying to get in here. He's like, you heard me. <laughs> anyway, I am Cindy Gotchel. I am the lay leader here. And Pastor Barry was supposed to have a day off. And um, he had a class last week, so... His day off consists of playing the piano today. Oh my goodness. <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> oh man. If you heard the music beforehand, that was Patty Dahl that was singing. And she will be here next week. Our service starts at 10 a.m. next week. Ron is taping. And I don't remember what else I'm supposed to say. If, you, if you're in witness protection and you don't want um, your head shown, let Ron know. He'll put something behind you so nobody knows you were here. Bev, do you want to say hi to our people online? Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning. Some new faces. Love you, and God bless you. <laughs> Would you please pray with me? From the demands and the pressures of this week, we come, O oh Lord, seeking rest and renewal. Hear the cries of our hearts, our prayers, and our needs. Heal and restore us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We gather this day from a week filled with needs and demands. Open your hearts in love to hear the voice of God. God's presence, free from the clamor of the world. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today our um, first reading is from chapter, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 10, and it's the story of Martha and Mary. Scholars have said this story is an attempt by the church to define the role of women in ministry. However, the main point point of this story has to do with discipleship and listening to Jesus instead of allowing yourself to be distracted with other concerns such as preparing food and cleaning house. The story of Martha, Martha and Mary is about our love for God. Martha works to prepare dinner while Mary sits and listens to Jesus. Martha asks Jesus to scold her sister for not helping but instead Jesus praises Mary. Martha and Mary are sisters, two sisters squabbling about household dirties, duties. Martha's worry shows that she needs to be more like Mary. The story shows that generosity and the love of God are intertwined. Martha performs the kind of generosity Jesus commends in Luke 14. And by sitting at Jesus' feet, Mary shows that our service ought to be grounded in a personal relationship with him. Following Christ means becoming like Martha and Mary, be generous, and love God. And now I read Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. And now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a woman named Martha, received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was worried about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve you alone? Tell her that she should help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art worried about many things but only one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that thing, which shall not be taken away from her. 
This is the word of our Lord. Praise be to God. And if you'll join me in the prayer of confession. Patient Lord, we schedule our lives down to the very second. We crowd in as much activity as we can and then wonder why we are so stressed out and tired. We are afraid to miss out on anything. And when it comes time to be with others, we spend our time worrying about details rather than longing for the visit. Forgive us when we get so caught up in the details and miss the opportunity to sit at your feet, learning, listening, growing in our faith. Help us to place ourselves in your care. Slow us down just a bit so that we can see the wonders you have placed before us and truly enjoy and share the blessings you have given to us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now I read from the Epistle of Colossians, and we're going to start in chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. The Apostle Paul and his co-worker Timothy wrote this letter to the Church of Colossae, which is a small city in modern-day Turkey. Paul speaks positively of the Colossians' faith, love, and hope, and acknowledges that the good news is growing in them. However, he has heard of some serious problems in Colossae as well, problems with false teachings, and Paul wants to help these people deal with their problems one by one. Starting in chapter or verse 15, the sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission of God that he gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. This is the word of our Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to read for you. Oh, Kenny, Kenny, Kenny. What are you doing? You um, look like you're sitting wrong. There, that looks more comfortable, Kenny. For all of our visitors today, I'm Amy, 
And this goofus is Kenny. <laughs> Kenny gets in lots of trouble. But we try to teach the kids about Jesus. So, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, hi. Today we're going to be talking a lot about distractions and paying attention to what is really important. Kenny, what's the thing you got attached to you? My cell phone. I never go anywhere without it. You yeah, know why? Imagine that. Do you know why I have it with me? Why? To keep up with the Yankee scores. <laughs> and the Buffalo Bill scores. And food recipes. You know why? Because I love food. Oh, Kenny, Kenny, Kenny. I don't know about you. Kenny, have you ever been trying to talk to a friend who's in front of you, but that friend is too busy looking at their phone to pay attention to Nope, never to had you? that problem. Imagine that. Have any of you ever had that happen to you? Yes. I know I've sat in on some Bible studies, and that is one of the number one things about cell phones being taken over our lives. Kenny, how did it make you feel when somebody else was too distracted to listen to you? Huh? I guess I should have asked somebody else. Pastor Barry, does it ever bother you if somebody is too distracted to listen to you? It does. Yep. So, Kenny, can it be distracting and frustrating when it happens? He lost his place. It can be, it can be disappointing and frustrating when that happens. But let's be honest. Have you ever been so distracted that you forgot to pay attention to a friend? Or that you lost sight of what was happening right in front of you? I know I have. Did you hear that? Has anybody else been so distracted by something? They forget? Did you ever burn food because you were too busy reading a book? Yes. Being distracted isn't anything new, and phones aren't the only reasons that we get distracted. When Jesus walked the earth, people didn't have cell phones like we do, but that didn't keep people from being distracted. Our Bible lesson today tells a story about a woman who became distracted even when Jesus was a guest in her own home. Jesus was in the, the village of Bethany, where his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. Jesus went to their home to visit. Martha invited him in and began to prepare dinner. Yummy. <laughs> While she was busy working away, her sister Mary just sat at the feet of Jesus and listen to the words he had to say. The Bible says Martha was too distracted by all the preparations that had to be done to listen to Jesus. She got upset when her sister went to, to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. This is the favorite line. Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> Martha? <laughs> Jesus said, you are so worried and upset about many things, but there's one thing that is more important, and Mary has discovered it. Martha was doing her best to make Jesus feel welcome in her home, but Mary had discovered something even more important that was sitting at the feet of Jesus and receiving his words into her heart. It is important for us to be careful that we don't get so busy doing activities, even good ones, 
that we forget to listen to Jesus' words and take them into our heart. If we become too distracted, we just might miss the most important thing. Oh, absolutely. Would you all pray with me, please? Dear Jesus, help us to remember that you are the most important thing in our lives. Don't let us get too busy with other things that we forget to spend time with you. Amen. Thanks, everyone. See you later. And remember, root for the Yankees and the, and the, and the Buffalo Bills. Whoa, I heard Dodgers in Green Bay. What? Yeah, that's from that little short lady back there that just read. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Mary and Martha. Hmm. So much has been said and written about these two sisters. What else can I say? <laughs> One is concerned about being the proper host, making sure that the meal is served promptly. The other sister seems unconcerned about such things. Instead of helping out in the kitchen, she simply sits at the feet of the teacher while her sister is hard at work in the kitchen. One sister takes on the traditional female role while the other one takes on a more traditional role. Why, who are these two sisters, and what can we learn from their story? In the Gospel of John, chapter 11, it also features two sisters named Mary and Martha, but they figure very differently in John's Gospel. For one thing, John names the village in which they live. Bethany, near Jerusalem. What differentiates in the two stories is the presence of a brother in John, the brother who is absent from John's gospel. We would, you would think that Luke would mention the brother. Of course, the stories differ. In John 11, Mary and Martha are grieving over the death of their brother, whom Jesus seems to have had a really close relationship with. There are similarities, but there's also many, many differences. It would be best, therefore, if we just come stay with the one story and not combine them. But, you know, we have to. Sticking with only Luke, we encounter two sisters who exhibit two different models of life. Martha seems to be a doer. Yep, Miss Martha is a doer. <laughs> Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> I love that part. Things that need to get done, especially when you have guests. Now, I know this Martha, when she signs up for cookie hour, she's got her cookies done two months ahead of time, and they're in the freezer. I couldn't do that because I'd take them out, pop them in the mic. Yes, I know uh, Miss Sharon does too. I would take them out, pop them in the microwave, heat them up for a couple seconds, and eat them. So by the time coffee hour got here, there wouldn't be any cookies left. <laughs> of course, Henry would help. You know that, right? <laughs> so Mary, on the other hand, seems to be the model of the thoughtful life. As I noted, Martha seems to fill the traditional role rather than Mary, for taking on a role of the disciple is traditionally a male role. However, Luke does seem interested in lifting up women who take on the role of a disciple. The question is, who's making the right choice? As a lay leader and a lay servant, 
I understand the need for making sure that the church building is a welcoming place. There is a need for teachers and caregivers for the children. Hopefully someone will set up things for the after church fellowship time. Doesn't have to be elaborate. There just has to be something set out there, you know, coffee or cookies, so that people don't leave too quickly. And of course, the Lord's table needs to be set. There's a lot that goes into getting ready for church and to getting the church ready for church. I find myself on Sunday mornings getting distracted. I'm not all that worried about coffee hour unless it's a Sunday that I've signed up for. But I do hope that Ron is here and that everything in the sound room is working. <laughs> I just got this from the sound room. <laughs> and I do hope that Bill Hurd is here because, and that the PowerPoint is on and is working. And I do know that if he's not here, either Ron has to turn it on, and I know that I'm going to get a clicker to try to keep up with everything. Doesn't always work well, does it, Bill? <laughs> I'm so glad to see that does it to you. <laughs> not just Bev and I. <laughs> oh. I guess that I get quite a few steps in on Sunday mornings in the minutes before worship that said, when it's time for the service to start, I would hope that everyone would be ready to worship God. We may need to be like Martha before worship, but once worship starts, well then, perhaps Mary should be more of our model. Martha comes to Jesus demanding that he tell Mary to join her in the kitchen. Maybe she thinks it's unseemly for her sister to be hanging out with the men. Maybe she has seen too many items, maybe she just has too many items in the oven and needs assistance. We simply don't know, but except that she wants Jesus to intervene. Jesus responds to Mary's request by suggesting that she's just too distracted. She's too worried about the details. And therefore, she's missing the point of his visit. Even if we understand, and I do, Mary's concerns, what should we make out of Jesus' statement that Mary has made the better choice? It's intriguing that this story follows immediately after the telling of the parable of the Good Samaritan that Pastor Barry talked about last week, wherein Jesus tells the lawyer to go and do likewise. That is, follow the lead of the Samaritan who stops and helps the person in need, something the priest and the Levite failed to do. We might want to try and merge the two people into one, suggesting that perhaps both are needed. Fred Craddock and Eugene Boring offer a different take. It is just too simplistic to say something like both are needed. Sometimes we need to act, and sometimes we need to sit still and listen. To the word of God. Luke's technique is more like that of the wisdom teachers of Israel who placed opposing truths side by side without explanation, with the tension itself provo provoking the reader to depend on reflection. Jesus offers us his take on what is most important about what the statement that allegedly comes from Saint Francis, yeah, Saint Francis of Assisi preached the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. That's come up so many times lately in Bible study. <laughs> we hear it a lot, especially in mainline church. Um, Protestant churches, 
I think we're more comfortable with doing rather than saying, or at least we think we're doing enough good things that people should recognize Jesus in our deeds. If this is true then, what should we make of Jesus' praise of Mary for taking the role of the learner over the doer? Jesus tells Mary, or tells Martha that Mary has chosen wisely. In part, there is an urgency here as Jesus heads towards Jerusalem. There is little time left to learn the gospel. Nice dinner parties are not the need of the moment. Tending to Jesus' words are what is needed. Besides that, as followers of Jesus, as his disciples, doesn't he deserve our full attention when he is teaching us? On Sunday morning, I'm not the only person who gets worried and busy. Being up front there, I notice a lot of movement here and there. People busy, doing busy stuff, and sometimes seem distracted from worship. The same Lord calls us to focus on him when we gather on Sunday, to move from our place of being worried and distracted by many things to the one where we are in touch with the one thing that is needed, the good part that will not be taken away. There we will connect with the source that brings both peace and energy to all of our undertakings. So here is an attempt to put the story into a context that tries to understand where Martha may have been coming from when she came into the room and asked Jesus to tell her sister to come out and help her. Well, it happened again today. Just like always, it seems to do, as it always seems to do these days, I've been cooking and cleaning all week because we heard that Jesus just might be coming into town. In the past, when Jesus came to town, the first place he stopped was our house. As would be expected, my brother Lazarus always invited him to stay for dinner. It's our duty and obligation to provide this kind of hospitality for anyone who comes to our home. This is one religious practice and custom that I not only understand, but I fully support. If I were traveling, I would appreciate if someone along the way offered me a meal. The troubling part, at least for me these days, is the fact that Lazarus does this without checking with me first, checking to see if we have enough food to offer anyone. Things are tight for everyone right now. With the new taxes that we have to pay, we're never sure if we'll have enough food to even feed ourselves from week to week. As the oldest member of our family, I've been feeling the the weight of this responsibility since my parents passed. Technically, our home belongs to Lazarus since he is the man of the family, but in reality, I'm the one that has to make sure the taxes get paid so that we can stay here and not get kicked out like so many of our neighbors when they couldn't pay their taxes. Things have gotten so bad that if I don't stop, or if I don't stay on top of everything from tending to our garden to preserving what it produces, we are not going to have enough food to to make it through to the next season. Lazarus and Mary, they haven't faced this reality. The truth is that I haven't really told them everything because I just don't want them to worry as much as I do. Worrying keeps me awake at night. Do you know what it feels like to have the weight of your entire family resting on your shoulders? That's part of why I'm grateful that Jesus may be coming our way today. He is the one person in my life with whom I can talk about these things with. He doesn't try to fix everything, even tell me what to do. He simply listens. 
Jesus is the most incredible man I have ever known. Please don't tell anybody this, but when he shares a meal with us, he insists on helping clear the dishes. When no one else is noticing, he even comes out and helps wash the dishes. Can you imagine a man doing woman's work like that? When Jesus sneaks out to help me, he always asks me how I'm doing, especially since our parents died. There's something about him that causes me to open up and tell him the truth, not only about what I'm thinking, but about what I'm feeling, too. When I heard Jesus was coming to town, I wanted to prepare a special meal. I've been so worried about him being on the road all this time like he is now. He travels from place to place trying to help people understand what God is really like. The word is, is that people are beginning not only to listen to what he says, but to take it seriously. I have to admit that I'm even more excited about Jesus being here today if it were just him that I had to feed, but that never happens. That ragtag bunch of fishermen and tax collectors and the other riffraff that he calls disciples are always with him now. They eat more than any group I've ever seen. None of them probably have had a decent meal in weeks. While I want to feed all of them, I just worry about whether we're going to have enough. To run out of food would be a disgrace, not only for me, but especially for Lazarus and our family's name. Things are even more complicated these days by not knowing who else might stop by when they get the word that Jesus is here. News spreads quickly in our town. Everyone from the local officials to the leaders of the synagogue come by. And of course, I have to feed them as well. I like having Jesus here. It helps me feel like I'm participating in his ministry by providing good nourishing meal and a safe place to rest. You may think it's silly for me to feel that way since women obviously can't be disciples, but Jesus helps me to believe that I'm con- what I'm contributing is important. I think that's what Mary felt as well, especially the last time Jesus was here. She felt like she was part of his ministry, so she went in to understand what he was saying. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm excited that Mary was very interested in what Jesus had to say. She doesn't realize the implications of what she's doing, though. She doesn't realize how this is going to affect not her life, but our life. She certainly doesn't realize that what she is doing could jeopardize everything that Jesus is trying to say and do. If I've told Mary once, I've told her a thousand times that sitting there with the men is going to ruin her reputation. No self-respecting man in our village is going to marry a woman who does things that women are not supposed to do. People will think the worst, not only of Mary, but also of Jesus. They already gossip about why he's not married. At his age, every good Jewish man is married. People these days not only say awful things to each other, I've got to figure out a way to stop Mary from destroying her future as well as Jesus's future. Maybe if Jesus was to tell her to come back out to the kitchen to help me, He would do it, or she would do it. So that's my version of the story, according to Martha. Attempting to hear this story from her perspective has helped me, and I hope it's helped you to remember that there is always another side to every story. Now, I wonder what Jesus would say if he got to tell the story from his perspective. Interesting. Let's pray. Gracious Father, 
Help us to remember that there is always another side to any story. Also, please help us to remember that we need to be like Martha and that we also need to be like Mary and sit at the feet of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. The vast injustices of our world grieve you, O God. Please use our gifts to lift up those who suffer from injustice and who need your hope and your presence. Amen. In the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, would you please receive the benediction? Just for a moment, take a deep breath. That breath is so restorative. It is bringing freshness and relaxation to your life. Go from this place in peace, and may God's peace be in your hearts. Amen.